To kick things off, today we're going to be talking about AI fundraising trends. I'm going to do a little bit of context setting at the top around what I think founders, especially the earliest stage founders, need to know about fundraising and dilution before you even get started. This applies to AI startups, this applies to other startups, basically anyone and everyone who's looking to raise venture capital can benefit from a couple of these data points. And then we'll get into specifics about what's going on with AI and how AI is changing over the last six months versus the boom from chat GPT times in early 2022 or late 2022, excuse me. This is a word from our lawyers. We love to kick things off with a beautiful little bit of legal text. Before you ask, yeah, you can totally get this deck. Email me, peter.walker at carter.com. Happy to forward it to you and you can share it with whoever you like. So a lot of times when startup founders think about fundraising, what they're focused on is how much money do I need and what's the valuation of my company? I'd actually challenge you that those two metrics are really the outcome metrics. They are the things that stem from the original decision. And that original decision is what percent of my business am I willing to sell for this amount of cash? It's dilution, the decrease in ownership percentage for the founder as you go through fundraising rounds. So let's jump ahead a second here and imagine the day that you are on the NASDAQ, ready to IPO, ready to ring the bell. You did it. How much of your company will you own on that day? Is it 75% like the founders of Atlassian or is it more 2% like the founders of DocuSign? There's no right answer here. I'm sure the DocuSign founders felt that they had done an amazing job and they really had. They had an IPO ready company. That's incredible. But ownership over time is the outcome of all of this fundraising trends and insights and opportunities. So keep an eye on how much of the company you own because that's the quality metric that you're going to want to track over time to see how you're performing against some of your peers. There are a lot of different sources of dilution. Before we get into the AI fundraising, I'm going to breeze through, spend five minutes talking about some of the primary sources of dilution that impact you as a founder before you raise any money. The first one, of course, is your co-founders. How many people do you want to start this business with? The median co-founder team on Carta, after looking at about 8,000 companies, is two people. So two, you and a co-founder. There are a ton of solo founders. There's a lot of three, four, and five founder companies. There are companies that have six or seven or eight founders. I wouldn't recommend that. It's probably too many cooks in the kitchen at the beginning, but two founders is the primary one that we see. And the first choice you're going to make with those co-founders is how much of this business do we each get, right? What's going on with our equity? And the standard advice that you hear around Silicon Valley is that you should split equally. If you have two founders, it's 50-50, that's simple. Actually, the data says that's not what's, what happens. Most founders, most founding teams split the equity unequally. So in two founder teams, about 44% of them split equally. And then three, four, and five founder teams, it's very pretty rare. So just know that if you don't split your equity equally, it's okay. That's an okay thing to do. You need to have in-depth conversations with your co-founders about this. That's the most important thing, not the exact number that you two fall on. If you don't split equally, it might be 55-45. You probably shouldn't be 80-20. That's a little bit too uneven. And then there's usually a lead founder in bigger teams, and that person's almost always the CEO. This is the biggest decision that you're going to make when it comes to what the outcome of your fundraising is, which is how much of the business do I own? It's a much bigger decision to decide how many people you will found this company with than exactly I give up 19 or 20% to a VC. So everybody in this business should have vesting schedules, including you as the founder. It's the easiest way to make sure that if you two get divorced in terms of founder divorce, you're not going to lose the company as well. Let's skip past advisors here and just go to early employees. You're hiring your first people. Maybe you started your fundraising journey. What does that look like? Well, first, you're going to set up an ESOP. That's going to be about 10% of your company to start with, not 20%. That's for when you're a unicorn. You can always add to the employee option pool as you go along. And then you're going to start granting equity to your first hires. That first hire, hire number one, 
in our data set gets about one to one and a half percent of the company. And that person is almost always an engineer. Something like 80% of first hires on Carta are technical people. So the idea that you're going to start your early team and build with engineers on one side and sellers on the other, that's very true based on the data that we see. The other thing to note here is that those equity grants fall off really quickly. So while it may seem like you're giving a lot of the company away to these people, or not giving away, you're giving based on earning a lot of the company to these early joiners, you know, there's a big difference between 1% and 0.2% for hires number eight and nine. So just know that these, these early employees are really taking a big bet with you. And so you want missionaries, you want people who cannot imagine doing anything else but working at your company, if you can find them. Let's jump into fundraising. So as I expect, most of you are on the earliest part of your fundraising journey, pre-seed, angel rounds, maybe even seed rounds. Um, there are a lot of things to know about the way that fundraising is done today in US startups. The first thing to know is that most of the time you are going to be fundraising on safes or convertible notes. Actually about 80%, 85% of all the dollars invested into pre-seed startups on Carta are going through safes. So if you're not familiar with the safe, I really highly recommend that you become familiar with that document because it's definitely the way that you're going to raise early capital from your investors. So if we dig into that a little bit, Safes, there's really only two terms that you need to focus on, the valuation cap and the discount. The valuation cap is the maximum price at which the safe converts into equity, and the discount is effectively the floor at which it converts into equity. So if you follow along with me here, if we imagine, a, if we abstract the safe a little bit, really all it says in the contract is, I, the investor, I'm gonna give you some money up front, and in return, I'm gonna expect equity in your business, not today. I will take equity in your business, but I will leave it until you raise a price round later down the road. So cash up front for equity later on. That's the simple agreement for future equity, which is a safe. There's a lot of different nuances with safes, but let's use some really basic math. If you raise $500,000 in your pre-seed round on safes and you do so at a valuation cap of $5 million, congrats, you've just sold 10% of your company even though your investors, those safe investors, have not yet received any shares. You still need to recognize that safes are not free. They are equity agreements and equity is a very costly form of capital. You only have a hundred points on your cap table. You only have a hundred slices of pie really. So how you allocate them is very important. All right, let's talk about uh, fundraising. Um, the one thing to know about fundraising is that despite all the doom and gloom around, you know, company valuations and what's going on in startups, there's actually been a really consistent amount of fundraising for early stage companies, especially AI companies, which is pretty cool to see. If you're interested in saves, I'm dropping a link on Carter that tells you all about saves, carter.com slash saves. Um, so we see about a billion dollars invested into pre-seed companies on Carta every quarter. So if you're thinking, how is there any cash left for companies like mine? The answer is yes. There's actually quite a lot of capital available, even though investors have maybe been a little bit stingier about the kinds of companies that they're giving it to. As I mentioned before, almost all this capital is flowing through safes, not convertible notes. The only real difference between those two instruments, by the way, is that the convertible note has an interest rate. And nobody likes an interest rate for early stage financing. That's no fun. So we're going to stick with safes mostly. There are some industries where that's not quite true. If you're building in standard SaaS or FinTech or any software kind of business, you're probably going to fundraise on safes. If you're building in biotech or hardware, pharmaceuticals, maybe your investors who might be a bit more old school are going to require you to use convertible notes. So don't compare too much across industries here. The kinds of safes that you're going to be building on are almost always post money. The YC default is what people usually use when they download these documents. We have both pre-money and post-money available to you on Carta, but most people choose the post-money. And it's what your investors are probably going to expect. 
And then within that, there are two terms that matter, as we talked about before, the valuation cap and the discount. About 90% of safes have a valuation cap. So that's the one that you're really going to focus on. Another about 30% or so, maybe a third of them have a discount as well. But that discount is almost always just 20%. So you don't really need to spend too much time thinking about the discount. The real question that you're going to have when you fundraise is, okay, I have this young startup. What should my valuation cap be as I go out to the market? There are a couple ways to think about your valuation cap. Uh, oh, first off, you're going to start with saves almost always, and then you'll move to priced equity once you get to about $3 million in, in fundraising. So start on safes, and then as you raise bigger rounds, you're going to get more lawyers involved, and you'll do real priced equity rounds. So here's where some of the distinctions between regular fundraising and AI fundraising become really interesting. So first and foremost, how do you, the founder, decide what your valuation cap be should be for your safe raise. There's a lot of different strategies around this. You might go look at comparable companies that raised in your space lately. You may talk to a bunch of investors and get their opinions about what your valuation cap should be. But in effect, to me, the easiest way to do this is just to think again about dilution and ownership. How much of your business are you willing to sell for that cash? If you raise $500,000, is that worth 10% of your business? Is that worth 20% of your business? It probably shouldn't be worth 50% of your business because that doesn't leave very much equity left for everyone else. So you can see that if you focus on within the pre-seed column here, there's a column that says 500K to a million dollars. So what we see in the US right now is if you're raising a million bucks, your valuation cap on a post money basis is $10 million on median, which means for a million dollars on a 10 million cap, congrats, you've sold 10% of your company. Now let's look for the AI folks among you. It is true that AI companies are raising faster and have a little bit more money and at higher valuations than other companies. That is definitely true. At the earliest part of the market though, we don't see a gigantic gap between AI and non-AI companies. So again, if you take that example, if you're raising a million dollars for an AI company in the States, maybe your valuation cap is 11 or 12 million instead of 10 million. So the difference there is you might sell 8% of your business instead of 10. That's a significant difference, but it's not a gigantic world away from what was going on before. Well, we will see later on in some data how AI is really kind of surging at series seed A and B but at this early part of the market, there's a lot of AI companies, especially here in Silicon Valley. So the AI isn't that different from the rest of the market overall. And again, I would just challenge you as founders to not focus too much on the valuation cap, but instead focus on what the valuation cap means. And that is about ownership. To take an example, if you were to receive an investment from Y Combinator, effectively at the end of the day, what you will have been doing is giving up about 7% of your business for $500,000. That will happen on a safe, but notice YC never talks about the valuation cap of their safes. They talk about 7% for $500,000. And that's the way that you should be thinking about your company as well, ownership for cash. The valuation cap is simply an outcome of those two metrics. Okay, so let's break out some more data on how AI is trending versus the rest of the early safe market. So each one of these bubbles in this chart is a different industry, companies that raised in that industry. And we've just looked at safe rounds from a million to two and a half million right now. So that's, that's pretty standard, quote unquote, pre-seed rounds here in the U.S., First thing to note, the y-axis on this chart is how much money those industries raised, and the x-axis is their valuation cap. And you can see that it's a pretty straight line. As you raise more money, your valuation cap goes up. That makes sense. You can see that some industries are a little bit less in favor with investors. You know, look at the ed tech bubble there on the left. Not quite as many investors getting as excited about ed tech these days. And then you've got that AI bubble on the far right. Everyone's excited about AI. In fact, that bubble isn't even to scale because there's just a lot of AI fundraising happening. 
So AI is definitely the hottest sector across US startups, and it has been so for the last 18 months or so. There are some distinctions happening within AI, but as you compare it to standard SaaS, cybersecurity, biotech, Web3, et cetera, you can note that it is still the king of the pile for right now. You, uh, the, someone just asked a wonderful question in the Q&A about the difference between AI companies and AI features for investors. I actually want to talk about this in depth. Um, there's a big difference between AI features and AI companies. And what we see when we skip ahead here, we'll go through a lot of stuff, but look at this seed stage chart. The black line is everybody else and the orange line is AI companies raising seed rounds. And you can see there's a significant difference between the AI valuation on a pre-money basis and the non-AI valuation on a pre-money basis. That is what you would expect based on the headlines. However, over the last six months, what we've seen is that investors have gotten a lot more savvy about what they actually consider an AI company. So it's no longer good enough to just have AI in your deck or call chat GPT. A lot of times what they're looking for is, is AI fundamentally changing the way that you're going to market or the way that you're building your business? If you're building an AI infrastructure company, actual foundational models, dev tools that uh, work with foundational models, et cetera, those companies are more highly valued these days than if you're building an AI application company where AI is simply part of your tech stack and you're delivering a more standard SaaS experience, for instance. So there are distinctions being made between the kinds of AI companies in a way that in the bull rush of 2022 and 2023, you know, investors weren't quite as discerning between those two different kinds of companies. So Akil, that was a fantastic question. Thanks for letting me jump ahead here a little bit. Okay, so we're back to this industry map. AI is doing well. You can see it's across a lot of different industries. The reason why sometimes we don't have this AI bubble in this map, though, is because all of these industries can have AI in them. You can build an AI Web3 company. You can build an AI health tech company. So AI is more of a theme that crosses industry designations rather than an industry in and of itself. Okay, let's jump into seed fundraising. So to paint the picture, and this is not a pretty picture, this is the context in which you are raising your funds. Just follow that black line for a second. That's the total amount of capital that has been invested, that was raised by the Carta cohort. So about 40,000 companies every quarter. And it's pretty clear to tell what happened. Things were going along pretty great. And then 2021 happened and there was a gigantic boom in fundraising. And then 2022 happened and that boom went away just as quickly as it came. So collectively, these companies raised about $70 billion in a single quarter. And today, that number is more like 20 billion in the most recent quarter. So from 70 to 20. That is the fundraising environment that you're finding yourselves in. The AI boom has made that a little bit better. AI companies are fundraising at a much faster pace than other companies at the moment but it's still nothing like it was in 2021. So if you're a founder today, this is the water that you have to swim in. And it's not really useful for you to compare yourselves to fundraising in 2021, because those are just gonna make you uh, feel pretty disappointed. Ignore that part of the market, we're in a new normal now. So how much does this impact your fundraising strategy? I would say quite a lot. Um, this chart is maybe a little bit difficult to read, but the clear takeaway is that if you're planning to fundraise every 18 to 24 months, you're probably going to be wrong. It's going to take longer between your rounds than 18 to 24 months. It used to be that the median time between say a seed and a series A was more like 15 or 16 months. Now that's close to two years. It used to be that the time between an A and a B was under two years, and now it's close to two and a half years. So you'll need to make sure that whatever funding you have, it's able to last you longer than you would have expected. So that either means one of two things. One, 
you cut your burn more than you had hoped, or two, you raise a bigger round and therefore can last through the period. But either way, you got to plan ahead here. If you're trying to fundraise every 18 months, you're probably going to be wrong. Some good news. There are signs that we're getting back to a normal in startups across the U.S. ecosystem, at least. So in terms of the number of down rounds, this is just the percentage of all rounds on Carta that were down rounds in a given quarter. You can see that there were very few down rounds in 2021, as you might expect, and then quite a lot of down rounds lately. We, I do think that that drop from Q1 to Q2 is great. It's really good to see that things are getting a little bit more healthy. Yes, this means that some startups are unfortunately having to shut down. But in general, I think that this is a good sign for U.S. fundraising for the rest of the year and into 2025. So again, if we just get into valuations, on a median basis, the valuations for a seed stage company hover around 12 million or so on a pre-money basis. And usually a seed stage round is about $3 million. So you add those two up, 3 million plus 13 million gets you about a 16 million post money valuation for non AI companies. AI companies are better than that. So they're raising at between 17 and 18 million in pre-money and they're raising a little bit more cash, maybe like three and a half or $4 million in that round. So you're talking about companies that exit their seed round and they're already valued at about $22 million. That's very expensive. That is as high as close to as high as it's ever been for companies in the U S. So it's a frothy market in certain patches, even though on the whole, it can feel kind of like a downturn. If you look at series A, it's an interesting picture here as well. The black line again is non-AI rounds and the orange line is AI rounds. And you can see that the AI is certainly outpacing the non-AI in terms of median valuation, but it's kind of stopped growing as much as it was in the last couple quarters. It's kind of flattened out. And again, I think some of that has to do with uh, the question we had earlier. Investors are getting a little bit more discerning about what they think is real AI, quote unquote, and what they think is just AI applications. I think it's very difficult to walk into a meeting with a VC these days and not have some story around AI, but it is no longer a guarantee that you're going to get a ton of funding if you just slap AI all over your deck. So don't worry. It's not you. The market has changed. All right. So this is how much of your business you might be thinking about selling in those rounds. It's still about 20% for your seed round and 20% again for your series A round. So if you add that up, you know, you're talking about something like 40% dilution, maybe a little bit less once you take in the dilution from earlier rounds, et cetera, et cetera. 40 to 45% dilution in those first two price rounds. That's a lot of your company. You know, that's a pretty expensive way to fundraise. So I maybe should have said this at the top, but if there's a way that you can build your business that doesn't involve venture capital, I highly suggest that you take that route if you can. Now, if you want to be a billion dollar business, it's kind of difficult to do that without any outside funding. Totally fair. But if you can build your business in a way that you want to without VC, I think actually now is a moment that you can really take advantage of some of the implementation and improvements of AI so that you can build your business faster and get to a higher ARR value than you would have earlier on with less capital. So it's not easy, but it is, I think, more realistic these days than it used to be. Just some little notes on you, for you here. Uh, you know, when we looked at all of the investment into AI companies across uh, our database for last year, the Bay Area really stood out. So not only is San Francisco the home of startups historically, you know, along with the Silicon Valley in the South Bay, but when it comes to AI, a lot of that boom is being concentrated in San Francisco as well when it comes to the U.S. funding market. So it close to like 45% of every dollar that we see invested into AI companies is going to an AI company in the Bay. Some of that is because the rounds here are more competitive and the numbers that are involved are just higher. But I do think it's true that as AI becomes a nascent center of startups, its home is in San Francisco. 
You can see some really great places starting to burgeon as well in New York, Boston. Cool to see Pittsburgh in the top 10 there with a great ecosystem as well for AI. A lot of different places have good claims to this, but really the home of AI startups is at the moment San Francisco. The last point that I'll make, because we're coming up on time here, is that this AI boom is going to change how you hire people for your company. This is, focus on that black line for a second. That is the number of new hires across all Carta startups every hired every month. So in January 2022, startups on Carta hired 70,000 new people. In January of 2024, that was down to 27,000 new people. So a lot less hiring happening. You're being very specific about the people that you're bringing into your business. And that means that at each stage, these companies are getting smaller. So it used to be that maybe when you raise your seed round, you had eight employees. Today, that's more like five. And maybe tomorrow or the next you know, two years, that might be more like three or just the founding team. So being very specific about who you bring into the business is the name of the day. It is a capital efficient structure that makes it easier for you to prove to your VCs that you understand how you're going to use this cash. All right, everyone, I hope this was helpful. I know we ran up right on time. Um, if you're a, a startup that has yet to raise a million dollars, you can get started on Carta Launch, which is free cap table, 100% free until you raise that million bucks. So we'd love to have you if there is anything that I personally can do to help you fundraise or help you understand US startups I'm happy to do so. My name is Peter Walker. I'm the head of insights at Carta and you can find me on LinkedIn or a hundred other places. Um, thanks so much for the attention and enjoy the rest of the summit.